Great, we're going to start. Greeting halls, good afternoon. Thank you for coming all in time, sitting properly and right in front here so you can see everything because there's a tendency to sit right at the back, right? Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Cloud Roadmap at InterSystems. My name is Luca Ravazzolo and I, and I work as a product manager here and I want to take you through, through some exciting new announcement that, that we have. Uh, and some work that we've done from the business point of view, but also in the software development part, of course, right? Um, and uh, I would like to make you appreciate and uh, give you a glimpse of what is really coming very soon. So, uh, first of all, let me ask you, how many have been to a container session or the container bootcamp? Okay, or about, what about Kubernetes? Great, okay. And how many people have been to Jeff Fried uh, Strategic Directions? Okay, fewer then, okay. So we're gonna pick up on some of those themes and expand them a little bit. Great. So the roadmap session um, is gonna develop with four main, main parts, very simple. Uh, we're gonna talk about cloud adoption and what we are learning, you know, um, and, um, and really it's about what we're learning from you, from the analysts and from the market at large. Um, because what we see really is just a continuous change, a there's a perpetual change, there's a continuous innovation, which obviously puts us under pressure as well, right? Uh, but you know, the cloud is a fact, it's, it's, it's a constant or, uh, by now in 2019. And then I'll, um, I'll take you through the main themes that, that we think about at InterSystems, you know, which are the main themes that we, that we focus about as, as we work for, uh, for developing you know, better business for you and, uh, um, and a new software and new utilities. Um, then we'll move to the exciting roadmap. There's some really interesting uh, you know, new components I want to talk about to you. And then I'll present the developer experience, which has two parts. You know, of course, you know, when you hear develop, you think, oh, you know, the, the guy is really developing something. But, you know, but it's, there's more than that because as prospect and as uh, existing customers, you might have the use case of you know, running a proof of concept. You might have a new idea that you want to start out. And you, know, you have to go through things like, oh, I need a new license from InterSystems. And it takes a week. I need to sign the paper, et cetera. So we, we're really you know, making the whole cloud world a lot more agile at InterSystems. So, Without any further ado, let's go, uh, let's go ahead. And let me start by giving you a couple of seconds to read this, um, or to internalize, really, this, this statement for, from Gartner. All right, so these are scary numbers. Um, and I was, I was going to start the presentation with lots of stats and numbers and things. But you know, in 2019, you know, we're approaching the third decade of this millennium. And all of you have a smartphone in your pocket. And all those apps are cloud connected. Do we still need to say that cloud is important? I don't think so. So one slide only, okay? And it's impressive, right? Because we all work in a, in a stateful, durable, persistent type of transaction analytics data world as we were told this morning, right? And so when you consider such affirmation, some strong statement, and it's like, you know, how are we gonna prepare ourselves to work with this? You know, many, many of you are already in the cloud, on your cloud journey. Uh, some of us are, are maybe just starting. And so I would say that, you know, we need to start thinking how we're gonna work in three years time or next year or now, because we need to start planning, right? So this pie shows where verified customers run and pretty much represent the market out there, right? So yeah, the number, the actual digits are slightly different in reality, but at, in large, by and large, it really demonstrates you know, the, the, the market share of, of the big guys out there. But the point I want to make here is that you confirm several things and the analysts do the same. And, um, and, and the market at large, as, as we look at our reports, you know, they, they, they all confirm exactly the same thing. There's much interest in the cloud. Uh, there is a need to be more agile. You want to have more uh, uh, automation and manageability on the cloud. So basically, there is a desire to have that the business has to be more responsive. The business wants to have the ability to bring things to market quicker, right? Much faster in, in the cloud. And so, uh, you know, th think about the business agility that uh, between, you know, between moving between cloud, for example, you know, business appreciate, you know, portability, business appreciate the fact that, you know, we can move very quickly, offer, offer, you know, go, go to market very quickly. And so these are all, you know, important things that, that, that we're thinking about. So, so very quickly, you know, within the main cloud strategy, you know, that, that you've heard we have, you know, so there's cloud, AI, freedom of choice, speed, 
uh, and, and security and stability. You know, the main three areas when we think about cloud, cloud development, cloud work for us are three. So the first one is just making things easier. You know, make we want to make things easier for you to try, to buy, to build, to run, to operate out there in the cloud. We want to make sure the prospects and uh, customers alike, when they have a new POC, maybe a developer has a new idea, you want to, you want to prove some, something new, um, that you can really go out there in the cloud and, uh, and have the best experience. It was the best experience nowadays. Well, it's dictated very much by what we mean by cloud usually, which are two things, you know, speed and agility. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are not a hindrance for you as you go on the cloud and you, and you want to run up, you know, test, test beds per, perhaps, you know, um, uh, uh, benchmarks, any, anything. Um, and so what we're focusing uh, uh, on, on many of our, of our new technology that we're building is very much, you know, they, they want, we want them to be API driven, we want to be, uh, you know, the, machine readable so that you can utilize and leverage any tool that is out there. And of course for us this means also that as we as we work with cloud service providers out there, you know, we become partner with them and actually with AWS we are advanced partners, which means in terms, you know, when you talk to us or when you talk to AWS, you know there's this team of engineers that already talked about and we understand and can support you, you know, in best practice and best architectures out there. The second thing that we are focusing on is optimization for low cost of ownership, right? And TCO, of course, is not just, you know, how do I quickly provision in the cloud? Maybe you're using or you're looking at into systems cloud manager and very quickly, you know, you can configure just about anything. But, you know, uh, it, means, it means understanding that, that your application, new application are very complex. And their lifespan then, you know, um, and the whole lifespan of the application needs to be considered. So we must have that, that long-term outlook um, that, that allows to say, yeah, it's not just the spinning up of the instances, the giving the best experience is day two operation, right? And that, that, overall, that overall cycle, life cycle of the app or the solution, then it, it's all really constitutes, uh, uh, you know, and, and we can go back and say, you know, was it really a low cost of ownership for us running Iris in the cloud? And so, so yes, as I said, it covers really two points, the a quick, quick provisioning, quick configuring, and day two operation. And the third area that we really want to, uh, that we think about in terms of you know, one of our main thing is um, we want to make sure that, that we offer you know, operation that are assisted. Uh, we can call them assistive operation, intelligent operation, or what do I mean by that? Um, and you know, we are working on systems and cloud platforms uh, that uh, where, where the solution needs to be smart, needs to be intelligent, and we want to leverage ML, machine learning technology and system models so that everything that you see in these slides actually become true because it's a rec recursive theme, right? If I use ML models that help me to optimize the system, maybe self-heal it, then, then, then it's easy for me to maintain it and operate it and run it. And of course, then it means that I go, you know, a low cost of ownership. And so this, this, these are really recursive themes of you know, easier, cheaper, and smarter that, 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 are, that, that are calling out to each other. So the first thing that, that, we, that we did, uh, it was in building a, um, you know, a, an OCI compliant, uh, an open container initiative compliant, tested, improved, a secure uh, uh, container. But the question is, you know, why is containerization um, so widespread, even in mission critical, you know, enterprise level uh, application. And I think there are, there are some values here. You know, there's portability. You know, when, when I containerize my application, I can port it just about anywhere. Um, the agility of the packaging, okay, they wrap the solution, which means then I can start considering adopting some of the DevOps uh, type of methodology. So I can improve my, the efficiency of my software factory floor. Um, and of course, you know, all that you know, brings into you know, a, a, a almost natural uh, automation. Um, let me just ask you a question. I think I asked at the beginning, but how many have been actually to the actual, the actual boot camp on Sunday, yesterday? Okay, right. So this, this, we're starting to appreciate what it means working with a container, right? Um, there's definitely a, a, lot, a, a lot of value there. Um, so. Uh, that was, you know, we started, the, 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 in a way, the cloud journey with, with that offer. Um, 
And then, and then we launched also InterSystem Cloud Manager, which is you know, our native cloud offering for infrastructure provisioning and deployment. And it's uh, multi-cloud or cloud agnostic. Um, it, you can run it with containers or without containers. You can run it against the cloud or your local VM on-prem, on bare metal, we, we can take care of that as well. So it, you know, it's, a, it's a tool that allows you to, to abstract away from the mundane, if you like, and, and use you know, infrastructure as code. So this is all good stuff. Let's go straight into the roadmap, and then you're given all this tool that you know, we're, already, we're already providing. So um, we already see them. The third bullet there for today says that, you know, don't forget that we continue to test all our products uh, on, on all the CSPs, the cloud service providers are there that we support, and that, 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 is, that means a lot, okay? And we leverage some of our tools, actually. Right? We leverage HCM itself. So every night, we spin up like 25 different clusters on the different CSPs, cloud service providers. Um, but some, some of the new, the new uh, news here for us are these 2019.3, as we released you know, this week. We have structure logging, no root container users, and new customer tool. Let's, let's dive straight into that. Um, so structure logging means that um, now we have the cconsole.log, which now we call messages.log in Iris, is structured. And you can have the standard you know, MVP def definition, or you can have a JSON uh, output that directly to an endpoint that could be like an open source you know, logging solution like Fluent um, or a commercial solution like, like, uh, like Splunk, for example. And, um, and let me just tell you this story. So we had this demo with Splunk, and we gave them the old cconsole.log. And the reality there was that Splunk out of the box doesn't understand just about anything. And so the sales engineer that was giving us the demo had to develop filters to understand things because it was that column that has, has uh, you know, one, two, and three, or zero. Well, that's the severity, but nobody tells you, right, if you don't read the documentation. So how, so is, how is a tool in your machine uh, supposed to understand that? You don't, right? So you need to write filters. And then we're asking questions. And, oh, I need to write another filters. Uh, and, you know, and he was an expert. And he said, oh, I'll come back to you tomorrow. So the following day, and then we gave him just an, an example of the structure logging. Do you know how many filters he had to write? Zero. Because those tools are just built to say, hey, I expect some structure here, and I can figure it out because guess what? Severity is severity. So you're telling me you know, how critical this thing is, right? Um, and the timestamp is a timestamp, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is um, you know, um, in the, has two advantages, of course. One is you know, a, a machine readable uh, type of technology. And, um, and uh, it also, you know, it goes hand in hand, you know, trying to create a lower cost of ownership of a solution based on RS because you don't have to go and write filters with anything. It's just out of the box. Uh, those login tools understand that. Um, the second bullet there is a non-root non default user. Our container up to 2019.2, if you go into the container, you see it has a default user root. That is not a good practice that if you speak to a security teams, they really don't look at you nicely. They say, we have a problem because it's root. And although you are segregated in a namespace, in a Linux kernel namespace, they still don't like it. And that's OK. And uh, I see that point. And so with 2019.3, there is a new default user in the container, which is called Iris Owner. And Iris Owner. Um, um, is actually uh, OS authenticated within the container, which is cool. It means that you can call to go into RS without username and password. So it's got some nice characteristics. However, because it's RS owner non-root and not root, when you mount file system and you do other things, you might have problems. So uh, because it uh, depends on what kind of configuration you have and how complex it is, we decided that it is you know, non -up a non-upgradable option. So pick 2019.3. Tested, okay, and then and then go ahead with that. There are some environment out there, especially when you start working in the enterprises, that do not allow containers with root default users. Okay, so we actually were we had our hands completely tied in some environment. You cannot come and talk to me, uh, and this way instead we actually you know we're, we're open to um, uh, to talk to any security team, and we're okay. Uh, of course, you can, you can, another important information, you can override all that if you have problems, it's a particular environment. When you create your, your container, deriving it from ours, you can reset the default user. What we're doing is just showing you best practices and how things should be done in the enterprise, okay? So, yeah, still free. The last point is, um, as we start to become um, 
more transparent. We open source actually the scripts and the Docker file that we use to create our own containers. So the people that are a little bit more advanced, they want to play with it, and maybe wants to leverage some things, wants to see how we do things, well, they're open source there. So, you know, have fun. What's coming next year? Well, this is really exciting slide. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here and then the following one. Um, we have um, a new control and manage Docker Hub for the enterprise. So Docker Hub, we all know that we can do just Docker pull an image, Docker run it. And, and it's okay for the C, for the com uh, community edition, right? But what about if I'm a customer and I'm paying you into systems and I want access to the latest version, right? And I'm paying Suta. Uh, but uh, I also want to make sure that, you know, um, my CI CD provisioning process is maintained. So I still want to pull from Docker Hub, for example. Uh, well, this, this feature, you know, we've been actually working with the Docker uh, in San Francisco directly. Uh, it uh, should be ready very soon and is to safeguard all of you enterprise customers, all right? So that you can, you can play with all the version, and, but, you know, everything is maintained and, and looked after in terms of, you know, we know who you are and so you're allowed to, to access everything in there. Then we have a new amazing feature that we call the CSF or uh, configuration state file. Um, to me, this is very exciting as it makes configuration in the cloud. Actually, not only the cloud, you can be on-prem, you can be still using Bash or PowerShell, who cares? Anywhere, it makes this configuration a breeze now. And uh, I, I have a slide specifically for that. This is really cool. Uh, let, me, let me talk about the Kubernetes operator. Um, that uh, you know, we are really eager to show where the, the previous session was uh, on the Kubernetes operator. So for all those people that want to leverage you know, Kubernetes at scale, um, it's coming. Um, we have a new exciting monitoring system, exciting in the sense that every artist instance has uh, some monitoring capability, but to get that information out and visualize and understand what's going on, Oh, mama mia, it's so difficult with, with InterSystems RS, right? And, and what we're doing here is quite interesting because we're actually, you know, lifting up the bar a little bit more and say, hey, I don't really care about the single instance. I want to see the whole cluster. So we give you a visual interface for the whole cluster. And, of course, you can drill down each, into each individual instances. And we're just leveraging what we have because we have 132 different metrics we can expose anyway. We've been exposing them forever. Uh, but we're trying to, to, to dress it up with a UI and keep it open source. Uh, so, some of the elements are op open source tools so that you can use just about anything you want. Again, into you know, machine readable, standard API, you can use anything you want. Um, we also want to, uh, are going to exploit very soon some new services, cloud services. So let me remind you that there are uh, ARM or ARM you know, chip out there, and AWS mentioned that they are up to those instances, instance A1, up to 45% cheaper. Very interesting. They probably don't have the same performance of some of the Intel, but, you know, money talks. So you have to evaluate how and how you can leverage those, those utility and those services. Um, S3 is another some uh, interesting uh, storage bucket that, that interests us a lot. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later. And we also have some news on generally you know, cloud services. So um, let me talk about the configuration state file. The config state file means that we can fit very nicely within new modern DevOps 12-factor uh, application methodology or principles uh, configuration world. Um, so what, what does it consist of? Basically, we are declaring the InterSystems Iris, you know, desired configuration. So I got my container or my default installation, it doesn't really matter. It, it, it doesn't work just with container, it works with anything. And so I install uh, Iris or I run a container and it has those, those default values that we all know in the CPF file. But to go and configure it, then I need to go there, edit the files, or connect through the, the portals. So there's all this you know, manual stuff. And anyway, the, if, even if we try to parameterize or use percent installer, for example, the problem is that you know, RS comes up, then I edit, then you need to bring it down, then I bring, to, to bring it up again. It's just not cool enough in the cloud world, right? So what the CSF, the configuration state file, allows me to do is pass parameters uh, as I start the instance, as I, as I run the container. And so the operation that we do in Iris is we just merge these diffs, 
that, that you give us. You know, I want so many global buffers, 132 gigabytes of global buffers, please. And um, we merge all that before RS starts. Okay, so there's no daemon running. So it gets the merge operation done, then we start. So it's a single operation. So it's very, very you know, intuitive, very fast, very efficient. Um, what does it look like? Well, it's standard, simple ASCII file. You can call it whatever you want with any extension you want, .conf, .txt, doesn't really matter, as long as what you specify inside is the string that you find in the CPF file. Yeah? So globals equals 00. zero. Unfortunately, we still have those, uh, uh, those old uh, nomenclature, but it's actually flexible because you can have different databases with different block, block sizes, etc. cetera. So uh, I, I define this ASCII file. I pass it to RS. How do I pass it to RS? How do I trigger that? Well, we trigger that with an environment variable that you see there at the bottom. I see CPF merge files, which does two things. It triggers RS to actually, hey, they want me to merge something here. They want, they want me to configure, to declare a new definition for InterSystems RS. And second, it actually defines exactly where to go and find the file. Okay. So I think this is really powerful, really exciting news because it means that you can automate your configuration, your deployment in the cloud world without going crazy with uh, you know, co either connecting, which nobody does anymore, or with the configuration management tool, or with Bash or PowerShell, you know, you can just, which you can just script that and just call the instance and we just do the rest. Um, the second thing is uh, that, that, that we are we're proud of, we have a new intersystem, intersystems Kubernetes operator. Um, and this is, this is super exciting for us, again, because it means that um, we are starting to really work and, and appreciate and offer you, you know, how we're supposed to work really in, in the cloud. And um, this is, if, if intersystems cloud manager is the native, uh, offering okay f comes from intersystems and so it configure everything uh, uh, you know that, that that we know about with our domain knowledge of intersystems artists uh, Kubernetes is the open standard platform that that we support um, but one of the questions when we look at something like this is well why should I care about, about Kubernetes well if you need to work at scale if you are interested in elasticity, automatic elasticity out of the box, if you're interested in leveraging, you know, platform as code uh, or platform first paradigm, if you want portability, not just portability of, of, of an element or, or all the application, because you say, well, I've containerized it, so I, I'm totally portable, that's true. But a container on its own is not an application. I need networking, I need DNS, I need firewall rules, I need to make sure that the whole ecosystem where my, within which my application runs is really you know, set. And you can actually do all this with Kubernetes, that's why it's powerful. So if you're after all that, you know, DSM, firewall and rules, auto-scaling, autonom autonomous failing over, uh, then Kubernetes is something that maybe you should look at. Right? So, so why is an operator I interesting? Uh, well, it's interesting because if you work with Kubernetes without an operator, it gets really tough to express the domain knowledge, specific knowledge of intersystems artists. You can't tell Kubernetes, oh, can you set up ECP for me over there? Or can you have a mirror pair? You can tell him I want two nodes, but he doesn't understand, doesn't know that one is a, a primary, one is a backup member, right? So an operator instead, um, it's built, or it's built uh, by, um, by extending the Kubernetes engine, which is built it's built for that. You can extend it uh, with CRD, uh, customer resource definitions. And, uh, and it does exactly that. It's, first of all, it's called an operator because it's supposed to replace a human operator. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. And because it knows knowledge specific or into systems knowledge, you can say, it's just a Boolean. Do you want mirroring? Yes or no? We know what to do. Uh, do you have shards? Yes. Okay, so we're going to connect them via ICP, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is, becomes a very powerful way of working in the cloud with this particular platform. So what format does this uh, operator? What, what is it? Is it add-on to the Kubernetes cluster that you are building it? Or what is it? So the question is, what form does the operator have? So an operator is, is it's a, it's a Kubernetes controller. A controller is an object that uh, there are series of native controllers in the Kubernetes architecture. You can extend that architecture with your own controllers. Uh, and the reason why they're, they're called controllers is because they control the, the effective state of your cluster given a definition state that you're given it. And so they have this reconciliation loop. Um, 
the, the systems Kubernetes is very much you know, an ex, no, a natural extension of the Kubernetes API, uh, API yeah, of the architecture, and therefore it fits perfectly in, into that. Okay? We have a session on Kubernetes operators on Wednesday. That was one an hour ago. It's gone. Oh, sorry. Um, this is the, exciting, the other exciting news that, that we have for you. We are uh, almost ready to package up and offer you a, 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 a monitoring solution that we call System Alerting and Monitoring, or SAM for short. Um, I think you know, monitoring is of fun fundamental importance, especially in the cloud. Uh, so let's say that you have like a couple of nodes, and maybe you say, well, I want to add a couple of shards for more performance as a query my database. So you know, we have like four nodes. How do you know they're even alive? And, and if they are running, how do you know they're running OK? Because you know, when I go to the AWS or, or GCP or Azure you know, main, main front end uh, um, portal, you know, it just tells me I've got nodes running. But how do I know the iris inside that node, inside that container perhaps, you know, is actually running OK? And yes, they, ha they all have tools right, that allows, allows us to plug it into the node and have a look. But what about specific metrics from InterSystems iris? Okay. Um, and, you know, do you know what, what is your baseline of your application, given a particular, you know, EC2 instance with, I don't know, 16 cores and, you know, I don't know, 32 gig of RAM? Uh, at, what, at what level does a CPU run on average? What does that mean when uh, the day before Black Friday can you scale? Et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's absolutely of paramount importance to have monitoring and understand our baseline, understand where we are. And by the way, we do have other sessions, other important specific session on monitoring here by our architects. So please go and see them if you're interested. And there's a session also on SAM. But let me just tell you that basically we are leveraging Prometheus, which is um, probably one of the most uh, famous open source monitoring uh, monitoring technology used uh, at the moment. It's part of um, the CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, uh, project. Uh, runs very well within Kubernetes, for example, etc. But you can run it on your own or on any machine; doesn't matter. And it has a great time series database. But uh, we want more than just metrics, right? Time series database. I want logs. I want to understand, uh, you know, alerts. Alert is a string. You know, what, what does a 95% CPU means? Uh, do I have a, a crisis, uh, you know, on my node or on my instance, or, or or is it just you know transaction data, you know, uh, being paid for that? And so, uh, you know, if I have an alert associated with that 95% uh, uh, spike, then maybe I can understand, you know, where, where and if there is a problem. And so, that, that's the point of all this. So, Prometheus leverage for the metrics. We associate together with Prometheus an InterSystems IRS um, 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 instance uh, to take care of string manipulation that Prometheus uh, cannot, cannot, cannot handle. And, uh, and also other things, for example, Prometheus doesn't have any security. So if uh, you have to come through our portal, get, get, you know, go through a credential process, and then you can go straight into Prometheus. We handle the, the configuration of Prometheus, just tell us where the nodes are uh, of your cluster, and then we give you a cluster view of, um, um, of the monitoring, uh, for the monitoring. Um, we think that this could be the building block for a lot more than just you know, simple metrics. You know, th think about you know, a self-healing system. Well, I need to know if they are sick first, right? And so that's where we, you know, we're heading towards. So I'm uh, going to have a look at the SAM section, there's, uh, the session. There's one after, uh, after this one, and I believe one on Wednesday. On the cloud managed services, uh, we have some news. So we, the system is gearing up. Uh, to provide even better total cost of ownership to, to you as, as a customer. And we want to offer you know, multi-cloud managed services. So some of the efforts that have already been uh, presented last year with the, uh, with the healthcare part of the pro product. Um, but we certainly want to make sure that we are offering you know, a generic managed service for any solution. Um, and definitely, you, know, you, will, you will hear during 2020, you know, more details will, will come through during 2020 as we further develop uh, our offering and, and our partnership with our vendors, of course. The second area that we're interested in, that we're really extremely keen about is the as-a-service market. So we're conscious that most of your solutions are complex, are sophisticated, and in general, you as a partner, you just prefer to focus on your core competency, right? And the, the know-how, the industry where you're working, you know, all the stuff that we don't know anything about. 
and just leave the mundane of installing, running, managing, upgrading to somebody else. Um, and so with the PaaS, with the platform as a service and SaaS uh, software as a service offering, we're looking really at helping you in lowering much of the burden that you have in your software factory, like provisioning, running, and, and the management. So um, by partnering uh, we know with leading edge cloud providers, we want to be able to offer you automation and enterprise grade architecture that hopefully will have, will have a compelling story for your PNL people. So stay tuned for 2020. So beyond, beyond next year, um, I think there's still you know exciting exciting news of what's happening. Uh, again, there will be still exploding of architecture, uh, of new architecture. Uh, we're looking at improving the scalability. We really want to be the platform that people come to for uh, for massively scalable you know databases. And uh, so we're really improving you know looking at improving that scalability part. We uh, really want to be in you know, an order, an order of magnitude, you know, faster. As we work to provide you with a low cost of ownership, we need to make sure that typical day two operation are simple to implement, efficient, and you know, they just work. They're effective. We want to expand. We will definitely expand. We're already, you know, talking to AWS and Azure and GCP. Uh, we want to expand the geographical presence. So that you know, no matter where you are in the world, you'll have a proper point of presence. Uh, you know, and so anybody worldwide, you know, will be able to use our global services, uh, so that you know, latency throughput, you know, are adequate for your application. Smart operation means that uh, you know we want to make sure that the intelligence that we can gather from ML model uh, can be you know really be effective, and so we can improve you know day two operation in an automated you know kind of self-healing way. And edge computing, well, the, the cloud is reaching out right here where we are. Uh, in all of your pocket, there's a, there's a presence. And so we want to make sure that you know, uh, we, can, we can better serve the edge as well. Last but not least, FAS or serverless. Is FAS a fad or is it the future? I guess posterity, we'll see. But uh, it's a, definitely an area that we're, that we're monitoring, keeping an eye on. So exploiting ar architecture, again, if, if you really look from a high level, it's all about, you know, really trying to lower the total cost of ownership, you know, and making, you know, and, and leveraging efficiency of all the services and, and technology architecture that cloud service provider offers us. So uh, on the ARM side, for example, we just poured into systems RS to the ARM chip, right? Um, somebody was telling me last night or two days ago that we just created a container for that as well. And why, why are we doing that? Well, AWS, as I said earlier, you know, says that you can run an A1 with about 45%. Um, um, it, it, it's 45% cheaper than, than, than a standard equivalent uh, other EC2 instance. So that already that is interesting in its own, right? Um, so we really want to leverage and help you out in all this possibility. We want to leverage G, uh, GPU and the, and the specific uh, Google TPU as well. They seem very powerful. Um, S3. Right, probably the smallest icon up there, but probably the one that, that, that can probably you know, bring uh, the bigger bag, bang for the back because yes, S3 has a different storage paradigm. There's an object, an object is not, is not um, a block storage. However, the cost is very interesting and we think you know, we really need to develop, um, to, develop the, to exploit that, that technology for, for databases one way or another. It's very different, but and if you have an idea or if you're already using it and you, and you want to talk to us, you know, please please come and talk to us. Um, how about NVMe, non-volatile memory, and Optane? We actually have a session on Optane. I believe there was one this morning, and probably there's another one. Um, if you're interested in this type of technology, it's very cool. So you, you put a database in memory, basically, right? They're non-volatile. Uh, and of course, uh, you, have, you have nanoseconds there versus, uh, versus milliseconds. And um, you can use it now, right? You can say, I've got a database, and I want it to fit into this, this chip that's one terabyte or whatever it is. Uh, but you know, how can we leverage that and make it automatable, make, make it you know, uh, really, really easy to use? That, that's our thought. So that you know, the overall, again, total cost of ownership for you is very easy. And you can maybe just define that you have a, a, an obtained chip, and, and, and we just you know, do something with it. And edge computing, well, 
Um, what about disconnected system? Uh, what about leveraging those cloud service provider, you know, fabrics that, you know, extend all the way to on-prem and to the edge, things AWS, um, uh, gr a ground station, for example, right? They, they really, you know, they build something specific for that. So it really is another strategic area that, you know, we're looking at. The marketplace developer experience, a uh, new young developer, okay, they just, when they need to do something, they just flock to the marketplaces, and we've been present there for a while. Um, and, um, and I don't know how many people have been to any of our marketplaces, for example, AWS, Azure, GCP, okay, good, great. Um, that's that's you know, the beginning of saying, okay, I want to try something out, we're available in the marketplace. Um, we also have, uh, of course, the uh, Docker certified uh, container. The, the, we, have, we have the community edition that is free. You can just pull it from Docker Hub. Um, and all this working that we're doing with cloud service provider means, it means a lot. It should mean a lot to you because it means uh, we're not locking you or, or you're not locked by using InterSystems R into one single cloud service provider. Yeah, you can port things. Yeah, it gives you portability. And that's very important. Um, so, again, for the developer experience, let's remember also the, the resources that are available from documentation to the open exchange, the developer community, uh, the, uh, the lear learning.intersystems.com. You know, it's all an ecosystem of toolings or available resources that really, really help. And I'm talking, talking like this because I think sometimes, you know, even as we recruit uh, young developers, you know, it's useful to have all these resources at our disposal so that we can send them uh, and learn there. And if you don't know where these sites are, you can just go to our website and there's a direct link to the marketplaces there so you can see the, uh, uh, the InterSystems Iris images to just launch. So as I was saying, learning services, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are really a strong part of everything that we do. We have a full department dedicated to this. Um, they have a fantastic new, uh, new website with that particular, you know, powerful filter that you can select what you want and a new developer, a new employee, a new prospect can just go through those three main phases. You can just learn, sit back, watch the video, trying to absorb some concept or if you want to exercise those memory muscle, you can start playing, right, and start hitting the keyboard and we give you exercises and you start really learning the technology. And then if your organization or yourself uh, wanted to really uh, you know, test a particular use case, uh, some, some new code, some idea that you have, then you can upgrade to, to building to build this something, and this is very, very powerful. And of course, in terms, in terms of building, and in terms of um, going to the, to the next stage, uh, you know, I might want to, to, to run on a, on a cloud versus you know, on the learning services you know, container that we spin up for you. We have new and improved way to try into system, so there's a lot of powerful news here. Um, so first of all, the, all this slide I'm presenting, uh, all options, they are free of charge. Uh, obviously, there's not production support that goes with that, uh, but there, there is developer support, of course. So on the left-hand side of this matrix, we have the cloud part. On the right-hand side, the on-premise. So let's try let's try to clarify with some calories. So if you have if you're a new developer and you want to start playing with it, you can just go to intersystem.com/try, like uh, Scott now uh, mentioned this morning. Um, it's uh, th this is this is an improved sandbox, if you like. Uh, it's cloud-based instance. It comes with an IDE. It's all just ready to play, ready to learn. So if you've been through perhaps our learning services and you've learned how to, you know, connect connect uh, your Java application, or you want to build some object, you know, whatever, um, this is probably you know a good place to start to uh, to play. Maybe you know try out some some use case. The second second um, highlight that, that we've done here is that you know uh, we have a small single node for development. So again, on the cloud, on the left hand side, there's an improve, improving of developer experience. Again, this comes out of AWS, Azure, and GCP marketplace, and from learning services. It again, it's a single node, single container, pretty simple. For the on-prem, we have a new developer download. We have, there's a new site download of intersystem.com. Again, is a single node kit if you need to download anything. Um, let's go to the more interesting, in my opinion. So the grayed out uh, there. On the left-hand side of the cloud, this is a new performant test drive. So let's say you have a proof of concept. That you, have, you have to go to a new prospect that you have, right? And you want to show him you know, some stuff. Um, but you can go to the cloud, so you don't have to install anything. You don't have to carry anything with you. You, you don't have to ask him to prepare anything. And here, we're working with, uh, with the Orbitera 
for this test drive. So it will be a cloud-based pre-configured cluster. So it will be fairly large, fairly beefy, but it will allow you to really, you know, uh, uh, test drive um, in a more serious way, um, you know, a solution that you might want to want to play with. Uh, on the on-premise. Uh, Part of the slide on the right hand side, we have a new evaluation service. This is very powerful for several reasons. So, first of all, it's accessible uh, for customers, right? Existing customers via WRC or the new Partner Hub. How many people have tried the new Partner Hub? Okay, couple, great, fantastic. Um, and this allows you to, you know, uh, to download kits or, or run containers. The um, the valuation service, uh, it, it's very powerful because now it has a new, a new licensing uh, complexity. Up to now, you have to, to read, go through the path and sign a form. And how many days does it take on average? Well, it's days, right? We're in the cloud world. Well, now all of that is taken care of by a click-through legal uh, you know, binding uh, agreement, which takes seconds. And you're up and running. And, uh, and you get you get your your key that way. Um, right. So this is all new. It's all improved. It's it's available. We've done more. Or we are doing more. Uh, what about if you want to actually buy and run? Okay. So what you have here is we have two new ways. Um, um, so at the top top left hand side of that of that slide. Um, you can uh, yeah, you can have a paid marketplace listing now in AWS and Azure. Uh, the pricing will be core-based pricing plus plus of course the platform usage of the cloud service provider. Uh, you pay directly the cloud service provider. So if you already have an account with them, you don't have to pay us. Just go through. So part of that same you know automatic uh, autonomous licensing. Uh, process that we build, it will be featured in here automatically for you. And any supported configuration is available there. What, what if instead I wanted to just, you know, uh, pay something, do some testing, uh, and, and maybe, you know, uh, you know can, can you interest them just, you know, imp imply best practices for me? Well, you can do that with the product deployer, so that's the second row up there. Um, with this product deployer, which is in, in beta, the pricing again is in core base, platform usage, uh, you pay, again, you pay the, cl the cloud provider, and you don't have all the, f the choices in the world, but you got T-shirt sizes, but it's very easy. So if you want to run something, maybe against a POC, that, that's really, really interesting. And of course, the BOL, bring your own license, that, that is still available. And with that, of course, you can set up any architecture, any solution, any key type that is more suitable for, for your need. As we talk about the product deploy, let me just give you a little preview of what it looks like. Um, and if everything goes well, there should be a demo on Wednesday morning, so don't miss that uh, in the morning session. Uh, it's just a t-shirt size quick deployer. I want a small, medium, large, extra large. We, of course, we, then we, we base, uh, based, based on that, that decision, we're going to provision the right, the right, um, the right nodes. Uh, based on intersystems best practices in terms of you know, memory configuration, global buffers, and storage, etc. Again, there's that automated product activation that I talked about. So it's automatic. You don't have to call us or call your sales rep. It's just you just do it. Go for it. You manage it the way that you manage your application because you know, we, we don't know your, uh, the complexity of that. And if you want to be part of the beta program, the testing of this, uh, this new wizard, then please you know, have a look at that bit.ly link. So, whether you need to use developer experience facility because you have a new employee or you are a prospect or you have a particular use case, a POC to try out, a new, a new idea um, or prototype, or you're moving to the cloud and need a better way to automate, manage it, monitor it, I think we have some exciting, interesting te new technology here. Again, remember that they should follow all the same three themes, you know, easier, cheaper, and smarter. And we did. I think it's extremely important to hear your, your side of the story. You know, we've got, we've got some, some good stuff that we're, we're building. There's, there's more coming and more, more that we want to leverage from the CSP. Um, but please, you know, share your vision, your problem, what keeps you up at night, what worries you, um, and, you know, make the most of this summit. Come and talk to us. Uh, we have... Um, 
we have lunchtime uh, talks around tables at lunchtime, the NYR NYRT, that will be advertised uh, tomorrow and then the next day. Come and meet the expert, request a meeting. We're here for you. We really want to listen so that we can shape the product and the future together. Thank you.